Hi, everyone. This is Scott Kania, CEO for Earthwatch. Welcome to our webinar series on forest conservation. This is the inaugural webinar. It is my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker today, Dr. Meg Lauman. In the interest of quickly getting to Meg, I'm going to give a very abbreviated version of her bio, which is incredible. Meg is a, a pioneer in canopy research. She's a scientist. She's an author. Meg, I think it's seven books and counting. Are we going on to eight? eight? To nine. <laughs> to nine. <laughs> She's an author many times. Uh, a longtime board member for Earthwatch. Um, and now our science advisor. Uh, equally important to all of that, Meg is an incredible uh, mentor and role model to young people going into science and especially to our female staff here at Earthwatch. With that, let me turn it over to Canopy Meg. Well, thanks, Scott. We're just trading seats here. And uh, everybody out there, welcome. It's really great to share some news about the trees with all of you. And thanks to our team here at Earthwatch that's organizing all the technology. And if you have any problems, I think you can email them a message and it should come through just fine. Uh, today, I want to give you a little perspective on trees, my favorite subject in the world, and hopefully we'll turn it over so that everybody can see the slide deck uh, more than you want to see me. And um, as you'll notice, the title is a treetop view of the world's forest. So I want to think about my world, which is studying the whole forest, uh, not just the bottom of the trees. And if you can believe it, for the last couple hundred years, most forest did study forests from the bottom up. They had a very myopic view of the tree trunk and made most of their estimates about things that were at the top of the tree just by guessing or maybe if they were lucky using a pair of binoculars. Uh, but we all came from the trees. Uh, scientists now recognize that even our closest ancestors, these beloved primates, uh, were originally tree dwelling organisms and uh, maybe not so much on the Saharan deserts and grasslands as we originally thought. So we maybe have a love of trees. Um, any of you ever climbed a tree before? You can raise your hand like me, but um, for sure, uh, it seems to be in the childhood of most of us. And that's really what my career came to be. I'm going to just give you a couple little notes on how in the heck I became a tree scientist. And then we'll talk a bit about why the treetops is important. And and I want to end this talk giving you a little information about the latest, sometimes the worst news about forests that we have. But um, I do want to fill the talk with some case studies about Earthwatch and how we are working hard to turn things around into a positive message. Uh, but astronauts study outer space. You probably heard of them. But did you know that Arbornauts are those people that study the tops of trees. So here's a picture of me as an arbornaut. And I guess, admittedly, even though my mom's probably horrified, I might have been one of the world's first arbornauts, having been a graduate student a long time ago, say over 30 years ago, that figured out a way to make a harness and uh, weld a slingshot and borrow a rope from a caving club at Sydney University and go to the tops of the trees. So that was how I became a tree scientist, but it really did all start in my childhood. Like a lot of you, uh, I grew up in the temperate zones. I often wonder what it would have been like if I'd grown up in the Amazon. But here was the backyard that I grew up in, in upstate New York. And for so many of us, we really know these trees where the leaves fall off every year and it's really cold for half the year. And of course, we have our very familiar maples and birches and beeches and other North American and New England trees. Um, well, the world is really not like that. A whole lot of the world is tropical, but I never knew that till I got to graduate school. And in my childhood, I made tree forts and I played in the backyard and 
did all those crazy things because I lived in a small town without a movie theater and I sure didn't have any internet or any computers. So as a result, I really got to love nature and that's how I started my career. And I think it's an important little lesson for a lot of us parents because if we can get our kids exposed to nature at a young age, maybe that will help them learn a lot about the planet. Um, another interesting little take home message on my little childhood story is that I think it's important to let your kids follow your passions. And here am I in fifth grade. I'm so embarrassed by this picture, but I had a little wildflower collection that I took to the New York State Science Fair. And I was practically the only girl out of about 500 boys with their volcanoes and other kinds of little science experiments. Um, but it empowered me, I guess, to think maybe someday I could become a scientist just from collecting those wildflowers wildflowers along the roadside. I was pretty obsessed too. Um, and my next door neighbor was also obsessed. So I always show this picture as a little example, but the guy sitting, uh, standing on the um, left of your picture is somebody named Tommy Hilfiger. And he was my neighbor and that's my best friend, his sister Betsy that made tree forts with me. But Tommy loved fashions in seventh grade. He even had a sewing machine and I loved wildflowers. So the moral of the story is maybe if you're a young person, try to think about what you love to do and turn it into a career. So here was my crazy career. And uh, as I mentioned, starting with a slingshot and a harness and a rope, I was able to become one of the world's first arbor knots. And the amazing thing about that is um, this was one of the first tools we ever had to go into the treetops. And this was 1979, which is pretty recent in terms of the history of science. You know, we'd gone to the moon in the 60s and people had invented scuba deer gear in the 1950s. So the exploration of trees and forests is really a very new science. And now we take this to the next level or height, so to speak. Here's one of my students climbing one of the world's tallest trees called Dipterocarps in Malaysia. And here's another one of my students. I don't even know if you can see Wendy in that picture, but she's in a giant sequoia out in California, which is pretty amazing. She's a really brave student and all of these new explorations are giving us lots of new information about how to take care of forests, which is really important. Um, since then, you'll find out later in this little talk that canopy walkways are part of my toolkit and they were developed by Earthwatch expeditions. And I'll tell you that story in a little while, but canopy walkways are great for taking a whole team of people into the treetops to study forests. Um, Hot air balloons are another wild and wonderful way to study the treetops. This is a gadget invented by some French colleagues and you can see that beautiful raft hanging below the hot air balloon that we use as kind of a base camp in the canopy sometimes. And the fourth tool for walkway, uh, for canopy exploration, we have our ropes, we have our walkways, we have our inflatables, and we can also use construction cranes. So that kind of completes the toolkit to help us figure out what in the world we can do to save forests, to explore forests, and to understand why is it that forests absolutely keep us alive. Um, so fact number one uh, that I discovered when I first climbed those trees in 1979, but over half of the species on the Earth part of our planet live in the tops of trees. So that means that saving forests is so critical for medicines, for foods, for products, for all kinds of interactions for keeping orchids and their pollinators alive, for allowing the pollinators of our own crops to have parts of their life cycle, for lots of the medicines that billions of people use around the world uh, coming from the treetops. So we really need to appreciate forests as this extraordinary Noah's Ark or home for all of the genetic library on the planet. Um, some animals like this beautiful jaguar live on the forest floor, but still need the forest canopy to shade them, to provide some of the food sources that they need and to continue their lifestyle as those important 
keystone species, even on the bottom of the forest. Um, other animals, like this pretty cool one, the sloth, lives in the treetops almost all the time, except sometimes it comes down a tree like this, either to poop, which is a whole nother research story for later, but oftentimes in this case um, of this three-toed sloth, to move between its mangrove canopies to find more food and eat the leaves that it's used to eating. So lots of animals need the canopy for their almost entire lifestyle like the sloth. Here's kind of a quiz animal, but this little teensy thing could fit on your fingernail, maybe 20 of them. And um, anybody out there in the webinar world know what they are? Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's called the water bear. It's its own phylum called tardigrade. And they do live in the treetops all over the world. They live in any place that has moisture, including Antarctica, including hot springs. They're very extremophile organisms. But the cool thing is we know there are thousands of them in the forest canopy, and yet we still don't even know how many species or how many individuals and all kinds of questions remain about what lives in the forest. So what we've really got to focus on today, I think, is despite a lot of research, despite our new toolkit to study the whole forest, we're still losing forests really fast. And this is even due, despite the fact that so many people love trees. Um, in my lifetime, we've lost over 50% of the world's forests. In America alone, we cut down 95% of our forests over the last 200 years. We've grown some back, but we certainly did a number on those old growth or primary forests. And a lot of other countries are doing that as well. So we really need to think hard and fast about what to do about our forests. Um, I'm a mom as well as a scientist. I had to juggle my kids who learned to climb trees early on in my career, um, but I think for all of us we need to think hard about forests because of children and grandchildren and the next generation in general it's a really really critical time and I want to talk today about a couple of those solutions that we have come up with to save forests uh, in hopes that you all will join forces with Earthwatch and me and others to think harder about forest conservation. Uh, one of the things that I do as a scientist is try hard to write a lot of my results in places and formats that can be read by the general public. So a lot of my books are now being translated into other languages so that kids in other countries can learn about forests. But for all of you, it's our duty, I think, as citizens of the planet to really work hard to save our trees. So here's four quick solutions and then we'll wrap up with a few of the latest issues that are threatening for us at the end of the talk. But um, there are ways we can do good with our forests. And I do want to mention that one tool in my toolkit as a canopy scientist, um, we can use canopy walkways to save forests, if you can believe that. And here's the world's first canopy walkway. It was built in Queensland, Australia. And the reason it was built is because I had Earthwatch expeditions in this forest. I brought hundreds of volunteers into Queensland to look at my critters, which were bugs eating leaves in the canopy. And I usually taught my families and students how to climb the trees. Well, the owner of the Ecotourist Lodge got a little nervous about everybody climbing these trees. So together he and I designed this first ever canopy walkway bridge. So all because of Earth Watchers climbing trees and because of kids maybe at risk of falling out of trees like that young girl who was one of my great butterfly catchers. Um, but as a result of that, we now have walkways around the world. Here's the newest one in Malaysia and it's creating a huge conservation opportunity for the whole country because when you build a canopy walkway, you in turn cause local people to get jobs, you create an economy for ecotourism, and in the end, these walkways are now causing local people to not log their trees, but develop conservation areas to make money from tourism. And this is a really, really important way to turn around 
all of our deforestation activities. Here's a walkway in China that gets half a million people a year. It's such a magnet for the economy of this region in the Yunnan province. So canopy walkways are not just a science tool, but they've become a really huge conservation opportunity. And another way we can save forests is through students. And Earthwatch, of course, is an expert at this. Uh, other programs through National Geographic or the Jason Project, where I'm uh, actually working here, are all great attractors of students. Here were a group of students that were part of an Earthwatch team that I mentored over in India, of all places, where we had bankers going out into the field and looking at water quality, but we had also volunteerism going on in the schools to talk about biodiversity in India. So all around the world, I think it's a really great opportunity for groups like Earthwatch or individuals or Girl Scouts or Sunday schools to make sure that we educate kids about forests. And if kids learn to appreciate the value of trees, then they'll grow up and become politicians or decision makers and really help us save our forests. Here are some of my third graders in a canopy walkway in Florida that I built. And guess what? They discovered a new species of weevil. They even got published in the scientific literature, all because they were kids looking for bugs. So you can use, I think, young people to become really great detectives out in the forest as well as conservation agents. Here's one of my bigger students, Anthony, at the top of a redwood tree. He discovered that something like 200 gallons of water is released by these trees every day. So you can see that they are essential for controlling the climate of the planet. Here's a few of my students that are mobility limited, and guess what? Um, if they can use their arms, they can climb a tree, and that's Rebecca on the left, and she published some new species of water bears. We found all kinds of new species in oak trees in Kansas, so it shows you that forests are real treasures for finding new species, and that all kinds of people can take part in research in forests if they're really excited to do that. Here's my student Bryson, one of the world experts in catching monkeys and sloths and studying their sleep patterns. So who knows, maybe some of you in this webinar will become expert canopy scientists someday. Um, a third activity that we can all do, and I take very personally, is to try to mentor women. And why girls? Well, in a lot of countries, women don't go to school and women have never been empowered to make decisions or be at the leadership table for conservation. Uh, so in this case, back to India, where I've done a lot of work, I always try to do research that engages women as part of my projects. And again, Earthwatch is really good at this. Here's some of my Earthwatch volunteers back in Australia, a lot of amazing women that found bugs, that discovered new things about leaves and were really a critical part of my project. Um, but in other countries where I work as a woman in science, I feel it's really important for me to be a mentor um, in these women in India in particular that spend so much of their day finding food for their families. Um, sometimes I go and take them tree climbing and give a little talk and bring a few pairs of khaki pants so they can get into their garb and go into the field and maybe they will become empowered by learning more about their own trees as well as me just coming in there as a scientist from somewhere else. And finally, my fourth case study, in addition to using our science tools to save trees and using students to save trees and empowering women as the stewards of the forest, um, I want to encourage everybody to think about who are those different kinds of stakeholders we can use to save forests? Not just the governments, not just the professors. In fact, most of those haven't even been very successful to date. Um, but one of the things that I've been finding successful in my forest conservation work is using churches and the religious leaders around the world, for the most part, really want to help the souls of the people that they guide in their churches, but they also want to save 
God's creatures, which is a very similar mission to me as a conservation biologist. So let's go quickly to Ethiopia. I'll show you this landscape here where you'll see that 95% of the trees in northern Ethiopia have been cut down. And when you take your uh, trading to market on a Saturday like these people are doing, it's a pretty hot, dry, and dusty travel trip. And you sure don't have a 7-Eleven for water and you probably don't even have a pair of shoes to wear on the side of the dirt road. So trees are so critical in other countries where we are losing them at extremely rapid rates and they don't have the income to plant them the way that America did a hundred years ago when we had cut down so many of our trees. Here's an aerial view of uh, Ethiopia and you'll see those little tiny green circles are the remaining forests of northern Ethiopia. If we go a little closer, you'll see that that little round dot has tree canopies um, and in the middle it has a round roof which is the Coptic or Christian Orthodox Church. So the good news in Ethiopia is that the church is saving the forest as much as possible, but the bad news is that you can see the boundaries are being sacrificed. There's no fences to keep the cattle out, and there's no ability for the people to see these aerial views without computers or technology to know that so much of their landscape has been logged and cleared. So the sheep and cattle get in, the kids sometimes take the trees from the edges, the farmers plow pretty close, and in the end, they're losing all these trees. So we need to work with all countries in the world to save their trees, not just the ones in our own backyard. There are trees in Ethiopia that have cures for prostate cancer. There are amazing trees in Ethiopia that have all sorts of other valuable uh, uses. Even storing carbon is essential for every single country in the world because we now know that keeping carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere is what's going to probably keep us alive in the next couple decades. So we do need to help all these people. And in my case, for Ethiopia, my stakeholders are the priests. And by giving workshops to the church leaders and telling them the important things that trees do for us, I can actually simply engage these priests in saving their trees. Here's the head priest who now is on a mission to save all the trees in his country. And here's how he's doing it. He's getting the people in the church to build walls using the stones in the fields. And they bless those walls and they make those walls to protect those native trees from getting cut down. And the people love the walls. They sit on the walls. They feel the walls represent the clothing for the church. And basically, this is one local solution out of many possibilities around the world if we are to engage communities with saving their own forests. The bigger challenge for me now in Ethiopia is how to educate the kids when you have kids that don't even own uh, t-shirts, they oftentimes wear their blankets, they sleep into school. If they don't have computers or books at school, how on earth can we teach them about environmental education and biodiversity? So one of the solutions for that is um, writing children's books. I have a book about saving the force of Ethiopia and for every uh, book that sold on Amazon.com in English, we print one in the native language of Ethiopians and distribute it to the schools for the kids. Um, and maybe that's one way of communicating messages, but every country needs her forests and every young person in the world needs to know the simple reasons why forests are important. And that can be something that we can all join together to do, educating our own kids, educating our locals, schools, educating our global schools on Earthwatch expeditions and other things like that. So those are some positive bits of information. I hate to end on the negative, but I do want to bring you a little bit up to date on some things that are happening to forests, which is reason why we really, really need to save our global forests. Uh, this is one of the recent pictures from Brazil, and probably a lot of you know that there's been some extraordinary fires this year uh, in these forests in Brazil. It's been a dry year in Brazil. 
Yes, fires have been burning down there seasonally for decades because it's part of the uh, clearing process for the local people. But over time, uh, those forests in the Amazon are really like a great big pie. And every time we burn a little bit of it, we have less left. And in the Amazon, a lot different from North America, it probably takes 500, even a thousand years to recreate a tropical forest, whereas only takes about 50 years to grow forest back in Boston, Massachusetts, or upstate New York, where I'm from, or some of the forests that a lot of us are familiar with. So these forests in the Amazon are pretty irreversible. They're very devastating. And because it's been dry, and because a lot of the land has been cleared in patches over the last few decades, it makes that remaining forest a lot more vulnerable. So this year, the fires have been out of control. They've been fiercer. They've been hotter. And they've been a lot more far reaching than they have before, giving the whole world a big fear because these Amazon rainforests really are our source of climate control and they are the home to most of our biodiversity. So we need to guard those the same way we would guard an art gallery or the same way we might guard all of the libraries and the treasures that we own as civilization. So it, um, there's a lot of um, energy going into thinking about how to do this, but it's a pretty, pretty uh, scary fear factor right now for trying to protect those remaining global forests. Um, my original country where I did all my research is Australia, and here's a really sad picture for me, but this is the rainforest of New South Wales, Australia, which also have been up in flames in the last couple weeks. Again, the hottest, driest temperatures on record for Australia, just really, really scary. So hot that a lot of these fires have ignited from very simple issues like lightning and thunderstorms or just on the side of the road from little tiny accidents from humans dropping ashes and things like that. So we have two countries with their rainforests high at risk because of fire and no end in sight at this point in time. So it really is time to take stock in our global forests and think hard how we can do things as a civilization. Um, here's some of the aftermath of those forests in Brazil, which is isn't so good because a lot of that is not going to be easy to ever reforest again. So kind of in closing, um, we know that canopies are the hotspot of the planet for supporting life on Earth. We know that forests keep us alive as human beings. Um, we now know, thanks to canopy research and exploration, that these places are worth a lot more if we keep them than if we harvest them or if we burn them. So there's a lot of responsibility out there for us to be careful and do good things. As Americans, we are leaders in consuming products and buying timber, and we've got to make sure that we really do save our forests. Um, one little project that I'm engaging in right now um, with my friend E.O. Wilson over at Harvard, who's pioneering something called Half Earth, saving half the earth for 99% of the species on Earth is maybe saving critical canopies where we can save 50% of biodiversity by building a few canopy walkways and maybe taking Earthwatch expeditions there to study what lives in them. So stay tuned as we try to work tirelessly as scientists, but we sure need your help as volunteers, as young people, and as adults to help us in our important goal of saving the forests of the world. So with that, um, I'll put those websites up on the screen and maybe talk to anybody who has a question. I think over here. <laughs> good, we have our question expert, our technology expert with me. So just I'll gonna, turn it over to her. <laughs> I'm squeezing in over here. There's a little bit of feedback issue before. It was because our computers were both on. So to prevent any bad audio, I'm just going to come over here. Hi. And we do have a few questions for you. Um, is there anything we can do on a daily basis to help save forests? Right. What a great question. Because trees are working for us every day. Even while we sleep, of course, they give off oxygen at night. So we need to work for them as well. And there are a lot of things we can do. Number one, we should all be planting trees 
for birthdays, for gifts, for whatever. It never hurts to have more trees. But it's really important to know that saving the big trees is the most important thing. When we plant small trees, we still have a couple decades before they can really be the force on the planet that the big trees are, before they can store as much carbon or support a lot of biodiversity or have root systems that save the soil and all sorts of other things. So um, we should plant trees and we should plant trees all the time, but we also need to focus on saving those big trees. Um, if you do live in North America, then you are part of the solution because we are the biggest consumers of everything. And whether we like it or not, um, we need Need to pay more attention to what we buy. If you buy timber for any reason, for any reconstruction, if you work in a community that's doing any kind of urban renewal, you need to be very sure where your timber comes from. And it should come from plantations, preferably in North America where they didn't have to travel too far, so that you're using timber that was raised specifically for construction industry. If you buy coffee, you should be buying shade grown coffee, not coffee that was grown in a cleared area of rainforest. If you buy tropical fruits, you should be careful for the same reason. Are they being harvested in areas of sustainable plantations or are they being harvested in areas where they've cleared a lot of land for two years and then planted oranges or bananas or something else only to design desert those areas and move on to some other place. Um, beef and soy are two of the biggest products coming out of Brazil now. If you're either a meat eater or a vegetarian eater, you want to be sure that you're buying products that were grown in Iowa or some part of the state so that you're not taking advantage of those tropical areas. If you're a teacher or a parent, you should be, of course, buying books about rainforests for your students, for your kids so they grow up learning about trees. If you ever take a vacation, even I am from Florida, but I promise you don't go to Disney World, but go to support ecotourism. Maybe take your kids to a canopy walkway in the Amazon or even a canopy walkway somewhere closer at hand, Florida or California, but think hard about supporting nature-based tourism because those industries help people in the tropics turn to conservation instead of logging. These are just a couple things, but there are just so many of those types of ways that we can help support our forests. Labeling our products is another one that we need to do better at so that all of you can be a force for your local governments to detect and determine which products you shouldn't buy. I might say that probably buying a little less is helpful. There are so, a lot of products that we have now like shampoos and soaps and plastics that contain a very evil product called oil palm or palm oil, depending on what you wanna call it. And that is almost in single-handedly responsible for clearing Malaysia and Indonesia and it's creeping into Brazil. So we, again, we have to look at the labels on our products and try to avoid things that are causing the destruction of the rainforest. Whew, that was a long answer, <laughs> but I needed to tell you. All right, that was a very good answer. Um, now we have a excellent question from Joni who's asking um, a bit about fires naturally ignited to renew the land versus fires that ignited for other reasons. Um, she gives an example of the Australia outback fires that occur naturally and those that are set to renew the land. When are fires good, if ever, at this juncture in our current deforestation conditions? Right, what a great question. Thanks, Joni. Uh, fire has always been a huge force in our natural landscapes. And where I lived and worked in Australia before I came back to the States, um, fire was a really important part. In fact, fire is needed to germinate a lot of those trees, like some of the eucalypts and Banksia trees that the fire and the heat of the fire causes the actual seed capsules to burst open, which is really, really critical for the reproduction of the species. So for many thousands of years, we've had fire as a force in our landscape. So here's the rub. Suddenly now we have humans 
cutting down forests, which always were a reservoir for moisture, for conserving water, for keeping the soils moist, for holding in the rainfall, because a tree is like a little sponge in a, in a sense. And also we have humans fragmenting bigger forests to make roads, to make towns. So we have these hotter, drier landscapes with fewer trees, and so when lightning strikes, or when those natural forces of fire come into play, the fires are hotter and drier and they get out of control. And we also have a lot of humans who have built real estate on the edges of fire. California is a great example where people have built their beautiful homes up canyons, and yet those are trees and vegetation that needed fire naturally to survive. So we have this terrible dilemma between humans and fires, and we have landscapes that are now more vulnerable to fire. So not a good answer. It's just something that we as people have to learn to live with. And either we will have hotter fires or we need to be really careful to protect those mature forests and not let them become patches of trees that are much more vulnerable to more heat and more fires. Awesome. Um, our next question is from Brian and he asks, um, when we see sustainable on product packaging, can the message be believed? Here in the UK, we see products that state they are locally sourced, but when you dig deeper, you find that this is not the case. Wow, interesting you say that, because the UK is held up as a better example than America. That's all I can say for labeling, that you have more of your energy transport labeled, you usually have more of the source of your products labeled. Like everything in the world, um, all of the uh, issues depend on truth telling and quality of products, and we see this everywhere. We have problems in manufacturing where we don't know if the shoes have come from China or the rubber has come from a good source or a bad source. And we just really have to knuckle down as citizens and demand those kinds of quality control from governments, from manufacturers, and it is the power of the consumer. We still know that the people that write the check and buy the product are in control, and so that's not an easy answer. It's not a simple answer, but as consumers, we have to try our very best to insist upon that level of control, and as with everything else on earth, um, we have to do our best to make sure that it is truthful. So good luck to you. And we have a long road ahead of us in America to even get those kinds of things labeled. We do have good examples of where it's worked. We now have pretty good quality control with meat, knowing that our meat is fresh and knowing it's not tainted. We have pretty good quality control for things like even coffee beans, knowing the country of origin. But now we have to dig a little deeper and find out what kind of landscape the coffee beans were grown upon. Awesome. Um, the next question is about ecotourism. Um, Emily is wondering what your thoughts are on eco, the ecotourist, ecotourism industry and whether you think it's a good idea. Right. What a great question. And, you know, Emily, that is a good thing to think about because technically ecotourism does bring people into beautiful natural areas. Uh, I often get asked, what about a canopy walkway? Won't it scare the monkeys or disturb the wildlife? And the answer is kind of yes. There's a little bit of disturbance. It definitely doesn't affect the insects. I've watched that. It usually doesn't affect the growth of the trees. Um, but the bottom line is there's sort of two choices now. Either people will cut the forest down or people will figure out a way to make money by keeping the trees intact. In ecotourism, for maybe the two or 3% damage it might cause to a landscape, I think is far better than that 100% clear cut that could be the other side of the coin. So I'm all for ecotourism because I think it's less damaging than what the other options could be. And if we do it right, ecotourism does bring families and kids into nature. And that is really, really important right now because I think it might create the leaders of tomorrow who will be more conservation-minded. Great. Um, we also had a, a couple of people asking about technology, and they're wondering if drones are useful in your line of work. <laughs> 
Good question. And drones are so useful. I just chaired a big summit on drones out in San Francisco last year because we pulled together all the drone makers and all the conservation biologists and other folks who are using drones for some level of technology. And it was a really lively couple day sessions. So for me, drones are great because they save climbing a lot of trees. I can use drones to map a certain tree when it's flowering. Uh, we can use drones to figure out if there's illegal logging going on in a very dense forest like the Amazon where it's hard to walk through the forest. Uh, we can use drones to figure out where roads have been built or perhaps where vines are taking over some of the treetops. Some people use drones to map out nests for orangutans and other kinds of canopy dwelling organisms. So yes, they're proving really, really helpful. And if you have more money in your budget, which unfortunately most, most forest biologists don't have anywhere close to the budget of NASA or people who study outer space. But in one or two instances, we have this thing called LIDAR, which is a satellite imagery, and that allows people to really map even things like moisture content in tree canopies and um, different qualities of the nutrients in leaves that help people understand insect outbreaks. So there are some amazing aerial survey techniques that we're starting to use for forests. Awesome, and we have another great question from Brian. He asks, um, you say in your lifetime, 50% of the world forest has disappeared. Is this slowing down or speeding up? Ah, wow, cool question. Two answers there. One is we need aerial technology to answer that question. And part of the problem with some of those mapping systems has been that sometimes a plantation of coffee looks the same as a primary forest. In other words, it's very hard to tell the greens apart from the air. So we're just only starting to get really good data to know if the world is more green or less green. And for the most part, the one thing we do know, which is a little bit disappointing, is that for all the areas that have been cleared, those new forests still don't take the place. They don't have the value of their older or primary forests. So we do recognize recognize that even as we're greening more of the world over time with plantations, they are not the same as those areas that used to be full of biodiversity, full of all sorts of wildlife that maybe are not living in the plantation types of forests that are getting replanted. So we're losing a lot of quality in our areas of forest canopy, I'm sad to say. Great, and we have another question. Um, does our government rebuild forests or is it mostly done by nonprofit organizations? Wow, very cool question. Of course, we have to look at a global scale and everything is so different country to country. I have a couple of bits of good news. Here's this very poor country of Ethiopia where I'm trying to save the old forests. Well, the president of Ethiopia just instigated a tree planting exercise last month. They planted 352 million trees, according to their government statistics. Now, I don't know anyone who's checked that data point, but the bottom line is they had a huge day and millions of people planted trees. So that's a really good example of how a government can at least try to replace some of the things they have lost over time. Um, in our government, we have a forest service, of course, in the U.S. that does a lot of our stewardship of forests and hopefully oversight to fires and tree planting and tree restoration. I know that those resources are very limited. Budgets have been cut. People don't really cover the bases because there's a lot of area to cover. So whether or not we're doing an adequate job with such a valuable resource is very hard to tell. And we certainly know that a country like Brazil is not capable of policing all of that vast Amazon rainforest because it's very remote and very difficult to police. So the bottom line is we need reasons for local people to police their own forests and to restore their own forests. And that's where things like ecotourism, where products that are sustainably harvested from canopies can come in really handy because really we need local communities to become the stewards of the forest more than governments. Um, this is kind of a good question for a segue. Do you think there should be an international law to help prevent 
legal forest fires, maybe like the UN? I think right now the UN needs to step in for one reason only, and that is because forests keep the whole planet alive. And when we abuse forests in one country, it really affects everybody else in another country. And quite frankly, a hundred years ago when America was cutting down her forests, it's too bad that somebody wasn't screaming and yelling about that. Um, and I don't wanna point the finger at Brazil or Ethiopia or countries that have lost a lot of forests, but I think what we need is a global effort to realize that this is a global resource. So somehow or other, we need higher powers than what the local people can sometimes do to um, help the resources of an entire vast area. It's a really big challenge but we have those kind of forces looking at things like, you know, how do we monitor petroleum? How do we monitor different kinds of things like the, um, you know, stock market or the economics of the world or the trading policies of the world? And we probably need higher forces and good um, intergovernmental um, panels and experts helping us make sure that this resource is preserved and that the people that live there are not you know, going to suffer just because they happen to live in an area that's so precious that no one else wants to uh, manage it in a way that maybe is necessary for their economy. Really complicated stuff, but critical to the future of human beings and the whole planet. All right. Um, we only have time for two more questions. So the next one comes from Joni, and she's wondering about trees, particularly large old trees that suffer damage in some way, whether it's from a storm or they, like an infestation or they get sick. Can local governments and other municipalities do more to treat these trees or is it just a process that needs to be left up to nature? So all trees have a lifespan, just like humans, we can't stay alive forever. And it is on a case by case basis, but I'm sure glad you asked that question. I've heard a lot of people and I get emails all the time by people who said, oh my gosh, my municipality just cut all the trees on our street because one of them had a little beehive in it or one of them had, seemed to have a little outbreak of some kind of defoliation going on in its canopy. So sometimes we're a little bit over vigilant, but occasionally a tree is entirely rotten on the inside or maybe lightning has struck a tree and it, if it is in a place that might be damaging to humans or houses or rooftops, then it probably has to be taken down. A lot of old trees can stay for decades. They don't need to do much. They're storing their carbon as they are. They're hanging on to thousands, if not millions of species in their canopies just by staying alive. So it's not as if they have to be growing vigorously. Um, scientists have even shown that bigger trees usually are the bigger growers, different from most mammals grow bigger when they're smaller, but we've actually proven that big trees grow bigger when they're bigger, if that makes sense, because they just have this ability to keep reiterating. So it's pretty cool what a big tree can do that's productive. But on a case-by-case -case basis, sometimes there are trees that are so old or so rotten or maybe so eaten by some marvelous insects that's figured out how to digest it that they probably are better off going back into the soil and putting their nutrients into decay. The worst thing to do is to burn a tree because you lose the nutrients to the atmosphere. The best thing you can do is decompose it or use it in some very productive way. Great. Um, and then the last question comes from a few people that wrote in asking this, and I think maybe it's kind of spurred on from the devastation we've seen in the Amazon with the fires. They're just wondering what they can do to either volunteer or donate. Right, wow, that is a great question. It's really hard to know how to donate actual dollars because there isn't, say, a, a task force that's saving the Amazon. There's not a great big uh, bubble in the air of water and we need to pump the water in and spray it on the Amazon. So I think your best bet is sign up for an Earthwatch expedition that takes you to learn about forests or maybe buy books for kids in school that have to do with learning about trees. Right now, enforce or encourage your governments to take an interest in being better stewards of tree products and 
and how we can save trees. We need somehow to get this message to our local leaderships as well as our international leaderships. Um, I have two websites up, my own website and Earthwatch where you can do some research. I wished it were simple. I wished it were like there was one single place like the Red Cross where you could give money to help the people in the Bahamas after a hurricane, but it's still a complicated world. The, the world of forest research is so young and so pioneering that we don't even know the answers to how trees really work. So we have to work, I think, long hours and tirelessly to figure out more about tree science, more about how to manage our forests, but we sure do need to keep pushing for that to happen. So thanks for thinking about that. Well, thank you so much, Meg. And um, I just wanted to plug, this is the first webinar in a series we're gonna be doing over the next several months. And our next one is gonna be in October with Dr. Richard Bodmer, who actually works in the Peruvian Amazon. So stay tuned for that. And we're also gonna be sharing a lot of this work that our scientists are doing with forests. So check out our um, website, our blog. Um, we'll be sending out a lot of emails in regards to all this content. And if we didn't get to your question, feel free to email us at communications at earthwatch.org and we'll follow up with you. But thank you all for attending. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Go plant a tree. <laughs>